Without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Amy Grosso and Chief Weiner. Dr. Amy Grosso is the Director of Behavioral Health Services at Round Rock ISD, a large suburban school district outside of Austin, Texas. Dr. Grosso oversees a team of social workers and campus-based mental health centers. Chief Weiner is the Chief of Police for the Round Rock ISD Police Department. They were both an integral part in the formation of a new district police department aimed at reforming school policing by focusing on safety and security, behavioral health, equity, and student advocacy. Their presentation today is Rethinking School Policing, How Round Rock is Changing the Model. Thank you, Dr. Grosso and Chief Weiner. Thank you so much. And we're so excited to be here to share um, what we've been doing in Round Rock ISD and even further of where we wanna go into the future. Um, and so we hope that today's presentation is useful. Um, you're always welcome to contact us after if you have questions or um, wanna dive deeper into what we're doing. Um, I do wanna say that I never worked into a, in a police department until I have been within this uh, job for the last almost three years now. So I think that's important information that this, um, as we've been developing it, it's also me getting to know the police side. Um, so Chief, do you wanna add anything else about your background or? So, yeah, so with my background, I'm coming from another school district on the East Coast, um, the 10th largest in the, in the country, where we had a similar model, but significantly different in that the mental health services was not embedded in the police department. Rather, the police department had a behavioral services unit, which were uh, sworn detectives that did threat assessments for the district. Uh, so it's a little bit of a different model where it was more siloed than we have here. And, and uh, we can talk a little bit about the uh, pros and cons to the two models. Absolutely. So today, while we're presenting information, it's also a conversation from both of us and our sides and how we collaborate and work together um, to ensure that we're doing the best by our students. So if we want to go to the next slide. Um, something that's really stuck out to me over the last three years, and it's that there's a very complicated view on even how police are in schools. And so you can go ahead and click the two um, transitions. A couple of weeks ago, I just did some, I searched police in schools and just wanted to see what came up. And, you know, we normally see these two dichotomies. We see that the school to prison pipeline and how police in schools um, disproportionately impact, especially black students or even Hispanic students. But then we also see on the other hand, school shootings on the rise, um, threats of violence within our schools. And so it seems like a lot of times what I have perceived in the options we're given is A, we don't need police in schools, or B, status quo and how we've always policed in schools. And there, there's not been a lot of middle ground, which I know makes it has been made it complicated for starting a police department, but I can only imagine complicated for Chief Weiner and others that are actually policed in schools. That's true. So uh, we, we're challenged because of the changes in, ex in expectations from society on where police uh, fit. And so it's been really difficult to try to find that sweet spot where we are, we have the community support and we're doing good work in the schools. And yet we are able to um, defend ourselves with regard to student outcomes to make sure that we're seeking the best outcomes for students. And I think that's one of the, uh, the distinguishing characteristics of our model is that in our uh, core values, we call them our pillars, uh, we are very very strong student advocates for the students of positive outcome from their K through 12 experience. And that's because uh, Amy's team and my team, we are, we're one team actually, uh, we are very much focused on the positive outcomes for students. So we advocate very strongly whenever possible uh, to avoid the school to prison pipeline scenario and rather we try to provide the wraparound services that will allow an intervention and a diversion, diversion approach to, uh, to the student um, success. Great, and we can go to the next slide. I wanna give some background just where we as Round Rock ISD have been, because I think it's important to know our history and how we ended up where we are with our different model of policing. Um, back in March of 2017, which I don't know about you, that seems like five decades ago for everything that's happened, is that we were informed at that time we had a traditional SRO program where we partnered with multiple agencies because one agency couldn't um, supply enough SROs for our schools. 
Um, but that's when the Round Rock Police Department said because of staffing that in years to come in 2021, they would no longer be able to support our SRR program. The same thing happened with Williamson County Sheriff. So we were in a position of what do we do next? So in another year, <laughs> so we knew we had some time that there was a re resolution that the board created to consider establishing of the police department. But with that also came um, a safety and security task force that was the board decided we needed an in-depth look with community members, stakeholders. What are our different options for um, safety, security, policing and schools? in which one is the best option for us. Um, that committee dug really deep into all of the options that we have and they came up with the conclusion that um, having our own police department was the best solution for Round Rock ISD. Um, and so with that, at the same time, I was hired in January of 2020 as the first director of behavioral health services for the district. So that was coming alongside, but at the same time I was actually housed within safety and security and then in February of 2020, so a month later, we were authorized to establish the Round Rock ISD Police Department. Um, if you'll notice, that was one month before COVID started. So that's been a really fun time to establish a police department and behavioral health services in the midst of it. Um, it's provided some great opportunities and growth for us. We had our first officers hired in September of 2020. In October of 2020, we hired our first social workers that are housed within the police department with me. I, I wanna say, even though this is, seems like a straight path, it's not been a straight path. There has been many ups and downs and things go great at times and there's other challenges. There's a lot of community um, education and community listening sessions so that we understand where the community is, but then we can also share how we are approaching this differently. Um, so I just want to think that background's important. Yeah. yeah, the only other thing I'd add um, is that the challenge with having a traditional SRO program that spans several communities, uh, uh, law enforcement stakeholders, is that each one of those officers uh, brings to the campus their department's policies and philosophies on, on policing, which um, then you have the challenge of not, not being consistent across your campuses in the application of those policies, because each agency uh, that's supporting you has their own take on it. Uh, but then also you have the accountability issue where those officers are not accountable to the district directly. They're accountable to their home agencies, uh, but uh, are indirectly accountable through the contract. And so that's a very challenging environment in which to uh, solidify and have a unified uh, effort. I would also say too, like hiring, like when you contract, you don't get to choose who your officer is um, for, for our schools and while we hire our officers and something's different and shows the integration of um, behavioral health and the officers together is that um, I've, I said on all the interviews with our officers, now it's me or the coordinator that I have, we're an active part of the interviews. Um, even with a new assistant chief in chief, I was part of those interviews. So really realizing that we can take a different approach from the moment of interviewing and hiring all the way through so that it, it we, we show officers from the time they're, they're, they come on that we're a different model and that we are gonna work hand in hand. And, and to that point, we've actually found that we've attracted specific officers to our agency because of our unique model, the, the opportunity to work alongside uh, mental health professionals, because it really, uh, it, it not only reduces the stress on the campus, but it re reduces the officer's stress because they know they have a team member that has a specialty that more, more times than not is applicable to many of our situations. Absolutely. Can we go to the next slide? So as we were developing what we were doing, um, instead of saying we only have two options, our options were, well, what if we think outside of the box and let's do something different based on the needs of students, staff, and community, not just what's been done in the past. Um, really to be forward thinking and how we can um, take all of our expertise. I think that's one of the great things of us being in the same department too. Um, we each get to be an expert in our area, but make the greatest impact for students. So our approach was based on first, I mean, safety for our community and our students and staff. That was the main priority that our community was very vocal that they did want police in schools, majority wanted police in schools. But how do we do that thoughtfully and especially with equity in mind and how that guides our work and how do we acknowledge what's happened traditionally and can approach it in a different way. 
We also want prevention and early intervention. We don't want to wait until a student's arrested to start being able to make an impact with our students. And you know that happens when we are housed within the district and that we can really start having those conversations. Um, we also looked at the increasing rates of mental health concerns in students. Um, mental health concerns in students has been on the rise since pre-COVID. Some people think it only really took off after COVID, but it's been for decades now. We know suicide rates pre-COVID even where it's the second leading cause of death in students. And so really wanting to take that and how can we look at that and be proactive and really address mental health needs? Because sometimes mental health needs come out as um, behaviors that maybe seem criminal or some of those things and we don't criminalize a student struggling with mental illness, but actually get them the help that they need. Um, and as we've said many times, how are we advocates in every area? How are officers advocates? How are social workers advocates? How are we advocates every time we come to the table, not just as a department, but across the school district? Yeah, and I think uh, more to the point about the increasing rates, what we've seen coming out of COVID is that during the lockdown period, a lot of these younger children have uh, not had the opportunity to socialize. Uh, and so they've become desocialized. And so when they were reintroduced to the, um, the campus environment, uh, across the country, we've been seeing increases in violence and, um, and suicides. And so, you know, those are those are the outcomes of what's what's transpired. And, and a lot of us had very little uh, control over the environment we found ourselves in the last few years. But now we're left with trying to deal with the with, with the outcome of that. And so mental health is more important than ever now to help in that readjustment period coming out of the, uh, out of the COVID pandemic. I don't want to conquer the fucking world. Next, yeah. next, next slide. We hope technology will work. Um, this is a video. Um, our communications team started this when we started having officers. It's called Meet the Officers. And really wanting to humanize our officers to show that we're approaching it differently. So this is a short two minute video. Um, one of our officers at that time, he was an officer. He's now one of our sergeants. And clearly it was, um, we did this video two years ago and we're in the midst of COVID. So that's why the mask. to get there. That's that was that yes, some flat black. I was both an athlete and a thespian in uh, middle school and high school. Um, I did the one act plays. I did the dramatic fall plays. I just didn't do the spring musical because I can't sing. So then I switched to baseball. My uh, dad was a military police officer for 20 years uh, and both of his brothers are also uh, police officers uh, one's a chief of police up in Maine another one is retired from the SWAT team in, in, in Maine as well uh, I, my first police job was actually alongside them and uh, at that department and so it just felt like a natural calling at this point in my career, I've been doing this the better part of two decades. I just had a transition in my mind where I looked at the landscape of law enforcement and I heard a lot of chiefs of police talking about making a change and doing things differently than we've done for many, many years. And this was the first police chief I ever saw that was actually pushing that needle, moving that needle, and I wanted to be a part of it. Interacting on a human level, trying to identify, you know, what people are about and how we can assist them and, and be the, the community leaders that we really should be. Well, I have five kids. So between all the soccer games, practices, running here, running there, there's not a lot of time for me, but I always make time for Sunday football. We're a pretty active group. We like to go hiking. Um, we camp, the RV trailer, all that jazz. Um, the big thing is just always keeping our kids busy. I, I just think that's a great example too of um, Sergeant Gobbin even talking about, he wanted a different way of policing. He was looking for that. And we have found so many officers that that is what they desire, that they want to change and they want to do something differently and that they see that's a possibility. So we're able to attract officers because we're doing things differently. And, and they take a stake in the student outcomes. And that's what, I, that's what we see every day on the campuses is uh, the act of advocacy for students. 
So a lot of my officers will come to me whenever they have a concern about what, what's happening on campuses, how the campus is being administered. Uh, it's just an extra set of eyes and ears around, you know, are we doing the best for the student all the time? And that's, uh, it's a refreshing approach to policing. And uh, we get also get immediate validation um, through, the, through the interaction with the students of uh, the job that we're doing, the, the role model that we provide, and just the, the overall mentorship that we try to uh, instill in, uh, in, with the students. Absolutely. If we can go to the next slide, I, we wanted to give you an idea of like what does our org chart for our department look like. Um, and so first is the chief of police is over everything. So I'm gonna let him talk about that side of the house. Yeah, so the police department is, in my experience, this is one of the most complex police organizations I've had the experience and, and uh, opportunity to lead. And so for, for me, I, I oversee risk management for the entire school district. I also see, oversee school security and compliance. And these days, that's a big wicket. Um, that occupies a significant amount of my time with regard to mandated uh, security compliance for the state. And then also, you know, under the police department, we provide our traditional police services. But we also are building a response capability with an active operations center so that we can monitor all of our campuses in real time. And that really is, in the event of an incident, we have the ability for a quick response, a quick coordinated response. But then the rest of my time, and it's, it's significant, I spend working with Amy and her team on strategizing how do we best um, continue the integration of our uh, efforts, as well as how do we uh, lever as much, as many of the resources as possible to the benefit of the school, student population. Absolutely. And then if you'll click one more time, um, this is the behavioral health side of the police department. And you'll see, I oversee, it started with 10 social workers. I now have 13 social workers and a coordinator of social work services. And this has all happened since um, August of 2020. So we've expanded and grown quickly. Um, it's important to know too, we have about 45, 48,000 students within Round Rock ISD and over 55 campuses. I think I'm right on that. <laughs> um, and so, even though we do have the a great number of social workers, um, we I still have to be very strategic of how we use them because they could be overwhelmed and I don't want to burn them out. And so we have 10 campus-based social workers and those are by our learning community. So vertical feeder patterns. So we have five comprehensive high schools, two social workers that support those. They get referrals from counselors, assistant principals, principals, nurses, or officers. So officers are the only ones that can directly pick up the phone and say, I need you right now. Others, we have a process of how those referrals work. And um, just because we can't respond, be on call for every school because of the capacity. But officers, we definitely respond immediately to. After that, we started seeing what are our needs and how do we need to continue to grow as a department. And one was a coordinator of social work services. She oversees our behavior threat assessment or in our intern program. We started getting interns and really have a very structured way in which we work with interns and they are master's level so they are able to see students and expand our capacity. I also saw we were getting a lot of referrals, um, our campus-based ones, for staff because of staff have needs just like our students. And so I, A, capacity-wise, we didn't have a ton of capacity for that, but B, I was very concerned about staff feeling comfortable going to someone that they see every day in the hall. Like, am I comfortable saying circumstances have changed and I no longer have food? Um, that that can be something that maybe you want to keep private or how can we sort of remove that? And so we have a social worker purely for staff and that staff across the district to help them connect with resources. That social worker goes out, meets with our maintenance teams, meet with um, our bus drivers, so uh, along with our teachers, but every what are our support staff that might need assistance. And so that, that's been a really positive thing because we know if our staff aren't in a good place, they can't help our students. And then the last two, we first called them crisis social workers. And you know, a lot of you probably realize you don't, everybody just describes crisis differently. <laughs> and what's a crisis to us as mental health professionals is different than a, uh, a campus. And so we have changed their name to critical incident response social workers. They do a lot of coaching on suicide protocols, threat assessment, we've used them a ton. And we are starting to integrate them more holistically into the police department. And I'm very excited for where that's going, some victim services, some 
How do they in real time help with debriefing uh, after something's happened? And so we're really excited for what that can look like. And the chief has taken um, helping us expand our views of maybe what we thought about those to begin with. Um, so that's the team I get to oversee. But while I have them in two colors, our integration is very flawless throughout. You know, the social workers who work on their campuses, they know the officers, they talk with officers. The officers bring them students all the time saying, hey, the student needs some help. Um, one of my favorite stories that happened, an officer was working with a family in a middle school. The kid was getting in some trouble. Um, we, of course, we were not arresting or anything, but the mother in those meetings was at her wit's end. She didn't know what to do. She was overwhelmed, working all hours, like didn't know what to do with her kids. And um, the, the officer came to the social worker and said, hey, I think this mom could use some support. So the social worker reached out to the mom and the mom was actually about to give up her rights to her, her children because she didn't know that there would be any other options. The social worker got to work with her, got to get her, you know, um, a little bit of rest, a pause, gave her different options, they made plans together. So that that mom, she didn't really want to give up her children, she just wanted some help. And so that referral only came from our officers. And so that I think is a perfect example of how we're intertwined and how we work together. Um, if somebody asks, now go ahead, what certifications? All the social workers are at minimum L LMSWs, most are LCSWs, and then I have about five that are LCSWSs. The critical incident social workers are about to just start going through some training on the police side, <laughs> um, hostage yes, negotiation. They're go through crisis negotiation training, uh, which is typically hostage negotiating uh, teams go through that, but it really is how we talk with people that are in a, a severe critical state of emotion and distress. And so the way we envision incorporating our uh, critical incident response social workers is they'll actually be on our police radio system and they'll be monitoring calls that the officers are getting and they'll be able to hear uh, the, the situations as, as they're developing and will be authorized to self-deploy to those situations to see if they can lend assistance to the officers even, even ahead of the officer getting to the scene themselves. So we're really trying to uh, integrate it as, as tightly as possible our efforts. And to that point, we jointly train the officers and social workers together on all, most of our protocols. And so they, they understand what each uh, is responsible for doing, but they also understand what the other teammate brings to the, brings to the party. Absolutely. Like I, some of the first training we did with the first set of officers, I did mental health first aid use with officers. And I thought they maybe all of them were mental health certified. So I was a little bit like, are they going to think this is a repeat? And they actually said no, that even in, within police officers' mental health certification, they don't really talk about juveniles and school-aged kids and how mental health can look different. And so I think that's some really rich conversations that happen in the training. But the training goes both ways. Um, an officer was doing a, a home visit with some of our social workers just because it was the safety concerns. And the officers learned really quickly. They're like, y'all have not been trained on how to safely <laughs> approach a house and what to look out for in these things. And so... Um, as you can see here, the basis is trust between the two departments together. It's not about this is my side, this is your side. It's really that we we each have a part in this because it is helping our students succeed, but we all have different lanes. And because we train together, we're in meetings together, we have relations, like we, we very much have that relationship together that when something happens, we respect each other's expertise in what lane. Um, I often get asked if we have a flow chart of when does a social worker and officer, no, there's not a flow chart because a lot of our area is gray. I always use the analogy that it's a dance and dancing only happens when you trust the other person and you have the relationship. And so, um, you know, you create these things and you think, okay, this is what we need. Is it really going to work? And I can tell you every day I see how this model and our social workers and officers working for the betterment of our students and the success they have. Um, that it, it truly does work, it, but it's because it's a collaboration. I'd just like to add the amount of effort we've put into hiring the right officers. We've also put that same level of effort into getting the right social workers. And Amy could talk a little bit about the diversity in our social worker cadre, yeah. because it really is amazing. It is. It's what I, I would like to say I did that on purpose. No, <laughs> sometimes you luck out. Uh, 
but somebody even asked the question like outside and do you work with uh, Family and Protective Services? Yes, um, two or three have extensive backgrounds um, working for CPS, which helps then um, us navigate those systems because they have firsthand knowledge. We also, we have a social worker who um, is back background is in victim services. So she brings that knowledge base and can help be the expert in that way. One social worker, um, she was a counselor for first responders before she came to the district. And so with her, she helps oversee our peer support program, which is um, support for our officers. She does that in conjunction with officers because we wanna make sure our officers get the support they need if something's happening or if a critical incident has happened, that we ensure their well-being. She has a lot of experience in PTSD. Yes, PTSD, which is <laughs> always important. And we have a social worker who has substance abuse background. And so really seeing that we are so much greater all together and how do we pull knowledge? And um, we really try, and this is with officers too, we each have our area of expertise. And I think that's modeled um, within the police department, the officer side, the social worker side, but then all together that we very much say, you don't have to know everything, know your area, bring your expertise, and then we learn from one another, which I think um, has been really helpful for us. And I think really gives people freedom to grow into the areas that they are passionate about and what they know. Um, I do wanna say one, one thing with this too, and something we've noticed, and I know, especially with Chief coming on this year, um, we have seen because of this close collaboration, our emergency detention orders um, for students, in, mostly in suicidal crisis, they basically don't exist. Um, we are able, we did one of all last year, and that's with 46,000 students, only one time. And that was a very complicated situation where the, the student basically didn't have any parents. Um, and so that's not traditional. <laughs> I'm learning more and more that it, typically there's a lot more than that, especially in school policing. Yeah, that's true. So coming from my last district, we, we were being scrutinized um, for the level of involuntary uh, commitments that were occurring in our schools. When we did a deeper dive into the numbers, we found out that the majority of those were occurring with contract officers, SROs that were coming from other agencies. Because a lot of times, if we think about it, they have a, a very black and white approach to uh, do, do they meet the criteria or do they not? And if they do, they go where here we have a much more uh, nuanced approach to it. What we try is we try to get a uh, voluntary commitment to happen um, through either a parent uh, you know, or self-commitment and, and things like that. So we try really hard to avoid those situations, of course, realizing there will be those situations that just call for it. Uh, but uh, we, uh, we had significant amounts um, in my last district. Here, it's been almost amazing how few we have, but it really goes to, I think, the success of the model. Yeah, because it really is, I mean, a social worker, officer doesn't have as much time as one of our social workers, you know, a social worker can work with a family for even four hours, trying to help them understand and not be judgmental to that family. And we've seen that, like, sometimes it is, it's the family scared, they're in denial because it's scared, and they feel like it's their fault. So how do we really help um, educate them? Because we know, if we take a student in without the parent support, their treatment isn't going to be as effective as it needs to be. And so that's just one example that I have seen why the model working together um, helps our students and our families. Um, next slide, we wanted to dive in um, on expanding what safety means. Um, I really started becoming interested in safety and security in 2019. I had a different position in the district and I saw the amazing efforts we were doing to keep students safe, safe from harm from others. Um, I'm a fierce advocate for suicide prevention and been highly involved with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And I, I didn't see the same amount of um, effort in, within suicide. And yet I saw that our students were dying um, across the nation and the state at higher levels by suicide than homicide. And so it was really, how do we start taking this broader approach for safety? And if we can go to the next slide, I really like this quote about safety and what it means. And I love that at the end, it says that, you know, for our children, the most vulnerable citizens in our society, a life free of violence and fear. And um, for me, it always goes back to my Maslow's hierarchy and needs and the bottom is safety. And I think a lot of times we think that's safety from others, but it's also safe from self. Because if I have thoughts of wanting to harm myself, that is huge amounts of fear. And it's also a high level of not feeling safe. And so I think that's helped the way we start looking at safety in different ways. So we can go to the next slide, which 
this is chief's expertise area. <laughs> so I'll talk a little bit about, you know, the, the holistic approach to uh, school safety and security. So we talked a lot about the mental health part of it, but um, fully, to be fully integrated, we also look at what the state, state mandates are as well as best practices in the area of safety and security. So a lot of things uh, that we do, and I'm sure many of, of your uh, school districts are doing the same because uh, a subset of this is mandated by the state. But we, you know, we conduct door sweeps. So we, we do that in multiple layers. Uh, we have a program, a grant sponsored program where our new hirees into maintenance are actually used during their first few weeks uh, joining the district to test schools to see if they can get in um, unannounced and without credentials. And so that's one of the uh, ways that we test our protocols to make sure the systems are working. But we also have staff and police officers checking exterior doors uh, throughout the week and throughout the day to make sure that those doors are, are being maintained in a secure uh, uh, position. And then our emergency operations plans, again, required by the state, but we, uh, we're taking an effort to make sure that we're doing annual refreshes and as well as um, instructing all staff on what's in the EOPs and not that, not that it's just a check the box effort. Um, visitor management is something we focus on. Uh, we know our, our traditional daily populations on our campuses. Our unknowns are people that come onto campus um, routinely as visitors. And so we want to make sure protocols are very uh, strict and secure in, in that regard. And we have systems in place to make sure that we are following up on, on alerts that we get from visitor management systems. Our cybersecurity is a particular area of focus, considering everything that's going on these days with ransomware and malware and attempted hacks. And so we have a concerted effort at the police department to work very closely with our uh, information technology services to make sure that there is uh, not just compliance with regard to best, best practices and protocols for cybersecurity, but that we also have the capability to investigate um, intrusions and to bring in other law enforcement resources as needed to make sure that we sustain um, our, uh, our integrity with regard to cybersecurity and IT infrastructure. And of course, we train across the board. Uh, we also have input into the instructional training and the, and the campus administration training requirements. So we can uh, dictate which training needs to be provided to all of our staff, not just our staff. And so it's a great tool that we use to make sure that we have consistency and to make sure that every one of our employees and volunteers know that they, are, they have a stake in state safety and security uh, at the campus level. And so that's really important because it is a team effort across the board. And then that all, all of that helps drive a change in culture where we are much more cognizant of our security uh, posture and the environment in which we, we operate. And I would say about that culture, I think, too, what we're trying to do is that safety and security, you know, it's normally a department. And while a department might help oversee, it really is all of us. It's how do we create that culture that we're all looking out for safety and it's not this burdensome thing, but it's what we do so kids can learn um, in an environment free of fear. And so I think that, you know, that could take some time. And, you know, even that PTA president that's always on campus, but realizing there's times they still need to go get um, their badge and still come through because we're being a model for others. So how do we even help our community and parents take um, initiative and that they can be part of the solution? And it's not a problem for them to do things, but they're actually helping. Yeah, one of the things that we've done also in the area of trying to change the culture is we push out safety and security notices to all of our employees on particular uh, matters. But then as a follow-up, once those are out there and published, we do hold uh, employees accountable for the information that's in there. So there is an accountability uh, aspect to our culture that we are aggressively moving in favor of. And so there have been some challenges because, you know, I think the, as the school safety environment has changed over the decades, um, school culture has not changed as quickly. And so now we are uh, challenged with trying to get our culture to meet the needs of, of our campuses. And that's, it's happening um, across our district right now. And speaking of culture, if we can go to the next slide, I think this is a great place. Um, I will say I did that on purpose, but behavioral threat assessment, um, you know, we're all mandated to do this. And actually somebody just asked a question if, if the violence we're seeing in society is, probably, is it around mental health issues. And I think this is a great time to talk about all of this. Behavior threat assessment is under behavioral services within the police department. 
department, and that's been very intentional um, because we wanted to move away where oftentimes, and I know this is never the intention of threat assessment, but I think even how we talk about it at times, it seems very punitive, right? We've got to catch the people who want to do the violence and then remove them or get them punished, like get them off campus, you know, that that's some of the expectations even by community members. But that's not the intention of threat assessment. Intention of threat assessment is not punitive. It's being proactive. It's changing a mindset that it's not removing the students. It's about what interventions do students need to be successful for education and to be successful members of society. Um, do a lot of students who are towards a pathway of violence have a mental underlying mental health condition? Probably so. Now, I do want to say most kids with mental health conditions are not violent. And that's why I think it's critical that behavioral health services, we own this, so we can really dive into the complexities of that, and that we don't continue to stigmatize mental health so students don't get the help they need. The last thing I ever want is a student to feel like they can't speak up about a, a thoughts of hurting self or even others and thinking that they're going to be judged for that, that we want them to be able to speak up so that we can assist them in getting the support they need. Um, and so I think that is a mind shift across society, but that's what we're really trying to approach here in, in the district and why behavioral health services and why our coordinator of social work services is the one that oversees the implementation of that so that we can continue that it's not a stigmatizing, it's a very proactive, how do we help students not punish them? Yeah, so on that too, I think that as, as important as it is for students to know they can reach out for help without being criticized or uh, stigmatized by it, uh, it's, it's equally as important to make sure that staff understands that threat assessments are not punitive, right? Mm -hmm. So historically, they've, got, they've done um, uh, discipline referrals uh, as a way of documenting these uh, outreach opportunities. So what we're changing is the mindset where we're uh, explaining to campus administration and instructional staff that uh, a threat assessment is outside of the discipline uh, circle and process. It may end up in a disciplinary issue, but it doesn't start out with one. And I think that's really important because by, by articulating the difference, we're getting more buy-in by staff to really try to engage in threat assessments when they're needed and when it's appropriate, and not just having them trying to avoid doing threat assessments because they think there's a stigmatism assigned to it. Absolutely. And I, you know, somebody just asked you, and I think this goes, does training need to happen every year for threat assessment? Does it have to and should it are two different things? Um, you know, we have this mindset that we need to be engaging in conversation. And that's why we say training isn't enough. We actually just did some, I will say it was training, we called it training, but <laughs> with all of our assistant principals yesterday in two different groups, and it was more case scenarios, because that's where it really, we can be in a room, we can talk through things, they can, you know, problem solve. Um, also our critical response, uh, critical incident response social workers do coaching sessions. So, you know, campuses can call them and they'll go and walk them through and really coach them up, realizing all our staff, this isn't their expertise. They didn't go to school, a principal didn't go to school to do threat assessment. They went to school for, edu for educating students and being that instructional leader. So how is we a department help them? And so that's what we're seeing happening. And it's really exciting because we believe the way we're approaching it now that it gets people more excited about threat assessment and see it as a proactive and not punitive and that they see it's going to help them down the line, not just be a burdensome um, task for them with time. The earlier we intervene, the less time it's actually going to take for staff. And also, the earlier we intervene, the more success we're going to have on changing behavior and changing outcomes. So we really put a lot of effort on trying to get um, engagement at the earliest level for early intervention. And the officers are equally a part of that uh, effort. So we're trying to identify those situations where social workers can come in with counselors and really help change outcomes before it becomes a criminal justice issue. And, and that's really where the team, the teamwork uh, is, shines. Absolutely. So we'll move on to the next one. And I just want to give you a little more of behavioral health services within our district. In the next slide, this is the definition I really like to use and why we use the word behavioral health and not mental health. That behavioral health is more encompassing. You know, it's this whole aspect. It is a person's mental health, but it's also the treatment of it. And it's also the support and the ongoing support and recovery. So it's how the social workers view the work they do every day. 
it's how they've been trained. It's this holistic model of wraparound services. Um, next slide. We also, most of the students we deal with are more tier three, very high level of mental health concerns or other concerns. But as a department as a whole, we look at it in these four ways. That it's first prevention, like the prevention is critical for mental health. And prevention isn't just in, within a crisis moment. Prevention happens all the time. Prevention is our officers that have snacks in their office and students come and talk to them every day. We know that one of the most proactive uh, protective factors for students against suicide is them having those relationships with a caring adult. And so that's prevention and that's what it looks like. And it's all of our part in the district in, in the community to do that. Then we have ongoing support. So that is we have some campus-based mental health centers. Like what are those that we know the students struggling in the ongoing support? Of course, we have crisis response and crisis response is an important part of what we do, but it's not all we do. And we can't just focus all our efforts there. post mention is always, what are we doing on the back end? And the back end might be a student coming back from inpatient treatment. How are we reintegrating them into schools? And this is an area we always have room to improve on to be able to make that transition smooth, but it's also, post-vention also might be debriefing um, the staff members that, you know, there was thought that there was a critical incident on their campus, and it really wasn't, but they still had that reaction that something was going to happen and that their life might be in danger. So how can we continue to move forward with debriefing for our staff in those areas? Um, next slide, please. I just want to show this. This can, this graphic continues. 2020, the rates continue to go up for suicide, and this is suicide versus homicide. And I don't want this ever to be viewed as an either or. We focus on one or not the other. It has to be a both and. But we have to really be proactive um, with suicide. The last, um, especially this last year, the 2021 data just came out, but they know a, a significant increase was with teenage boys. And for me, this is also equity work of how do we address this growing concern for our Male students who their um, their their deaths by suicide rate is higher than um, girls, and what can we do, and how can we start looking out for that? And that's an area that we haven't like succeeded in yet. Like, have how do we do that differently? But I think that's an area of growth and where we're always looking uh, to improve. I do want to. Somebody did ask the question. I think this is a good time to answer it. Just about how do we, with social workers and officers working together, confidentiality. Um, you know, our reporting, like our case notes and everything for social workers is completely separate from the officers. In the same way officers <laughs> report, we do not have access to those. Um, we hold those confidentialities and um, by ethical standards and guidance. Now, it does help at times because we're within the same department of information that can be shared on an as need to know basis. Just because we can share information doesn't mean we should, and that's the approach we are all, always take. Um, in all areas. But then there's always, always also those opportunities where in a traditional model, uh, there are times where you should share the information, but there's hesitancy because you don't have the trust. Mm -hmm. And so we've alleviated that by working together so closely that when the time is right for us to share information, there's there are no other conversations happening except what do we need to share. Yeah. Somebody did ask caseloads of social workers. Um, it's high, it depends by month, by week, what's going on. I will say they do not do long-term um, therapy with our students. We have some mental health centers. T-Chat, if you're not part of T-Chat program, your school, please look into that. It, it's free to students. So we utilize other avenues for that longer term. It's more short term, connecting them with resources. We're very much more heavy on the case management part than the therapeutic services. And then that way we can see more students and be able to serve um, a broader range of what's going on. Um, next slide, please. So there was a question on, on ways to decrease uh, truancy. So one of the things that Amy and I are working on is a matrix of indicators of um, things that may show that a student is in need of additional services. And so one of those is, is runaway, a runaway student. So, you know, when we look at runaways, there are two aspects to it. There's the risk that the child is going to experience by running away and being outside of their secure environment. Uh, and sometimes that happens from a campus and that's where we get directly involved. But then there are those other situations as to when they're running away from home, why are they running away from home? So it may just be that they have a, uh, you know, a conflict with the parent over something that's inconsequential 
or maybe that that child is is uh, experiencing some sort of neglect or abuse at home. And so those are other opportunities for us to start asking questions around why are we why is the child experiencing this behavior? And we take those very seriously right now. So we have a list of indicators that we go through that help us navigate what resources may be best applied. Absolutely. Um, also, somebody asked, and I think this is a great time to answer this before we talk about therapy dogs, which everybody loves. Um, have you seen any situations where officers or other staff struggle um, with the model instead of being more punitive stance and all of those? Um, yes, of course. Um, and I think even with our officers, we saw at the beginning, it's not because they didn't want to be with the new model, but it's a change. They've been doing one way of their job for 20 years, and then they're trying to change. And I think that's where um, our departments together, we have seen some great opportunities. Um, one of the, my favorite stories is a new officer had come in and they were actually having to do a transport of a student um, with severe mental health um, concerns. Um, the family didn't have transportation, so it wasn't an emergency detention kind of thing. It was just, there was no other way for the student to get to the hospital. And he looked at the social worker and said, how is she going to respond when I handcuff her? And she's like, the social worker spoke up and said, you're not going to handcuff her. That's not what we do in this department because she's not done anything wrong. And it was one of those gentle things. So it wasn't a confrontation. It wasn't, you don't know what you're talking about. It's those sm small moments of education that happen both ways that I think only happen because we're in the same department. If we weren't in the same department and a, the person tried to tell an officer that, the officer would be like, why, why are you telling me how to do my job? I'm not telling you how to do yours. And so I think that's the beauty that sometimes happens. In what we're doing and, and to highlight that both both parties in that conversation felt comfortable asking right? yes <laughs> and having that discussion yeah so i think that's a real a sweet spot yeah and so i mean are there times that there has to be bigger discussions yes but you know we do those i do think the way in which we hire and we're very upfront of our model that 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 helps them and let's be honest some of the interview questions when you ask them you can tell if somebody has that mindset of wanting to be the model of policing we're doing or we don't in the same way, when I interview social workers, they get told from the beginning, beginning you're going to be working in a police department. And because I think it's very important to be so upfront about that and what that means and what that looks like. Um, a program that was started right from the beginning of the department is we have therapy dogs. Um, we are slowly rolling them out. <laughs> we, um, but either an officer or a social worker is the primary handler. And so if we can push play on this video, we'll watch the video first and they can talk a little more about it. As a puppy, Winter was always very curious and observant. The first day I had her, she saw me put the bag of dog treats on top of my fridge, and the next day I caught her on top of the counter trying to get them. <laughs> um, and she's also stolen some tacos um, from the countertop. Her family that she was born into gave her the name Winter, and so I kept that for her. Um, but the great thing about the therapy dog program is the funds to create it was through donors, and so Pfluger Architects was Winter's donor, and they gave her her nickname Coco. And so um, some students call her Winter, some call her Coco, or some people like to do the full name Winter Coco. I'd say Winter's favorite thing to do is just brighten students and staff's day. Really, she just enjoys the attention from others and she ends up getting to brighten their day. Winter loves to be outside, so she spends most of her time in the backyard. Um, she likes to watch squirrels and birds. She enjoys eating her treats outside. She loves the rain and when we do go hiking or camping, she loves to swim. So Winter has two dog siblings. I have a golden retriever named French Fry and then a 
little one named Dodger and Winter loves playing with them as well and even napping with them. They're um, always together. So of course the therapy dogs are the favorite people in the entire district. <laughs> and while we wish they could be at campuses doing just general visits all day, every day, um, our social workers and officers have other things. And so we're really currently redefining our referral process and what is an appropriate referral for the therapy dogs. Um, Winter is starting to do some work with students at uh, elementary schools that have been identified with some high anxiety, social anxiety, and they've already seen within a few visits how the therapy dog has helped the students. So really targeting. We like the proactive fun visits. Um, we use Gizmo's Read Along. It's a therapy dog book. You can Google Gizmo. Um, and free curriculum. So we do that for some proactive stuff within elementary students, but really how do we use them for their intention as a therapy dog? And even within crisis situations or when students are escalated, can they help de-escalate um, quicker than other ways? It, and it's one of the tools that we have now to try to do the de-escalation. And, and I can tell you with specific students, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, even with the same student. So we've had situations where a student will de-escalate in the presence of the dog and other times where they're just so beyond that level of you know, retreat or mm -hmm. getting back to normal that they just don't respond to the dog, which is okay. It's, it's not gonna work every time, but those times that it does work, it's just amazing. And the other thing that we're hoping to do, uh, we're authorized for about five dogs at this point. And as we go forward, we're, we're looking at how do we begin a, more of a, a a directed therapy program for specific students uh, in the school environment because there are, there are going to be those opportunities I think where we can really uh, change the learning experience for the students especially some of those that are special needs or um, on the spectrum with autism. We've seen really good results with the dogs bringing those students out and making them more social and so uh, more communicative in a lot of times and so those are opportunities that we're looking to explore as we go forward. We even found it would have Yesterday, one of the, our social workers, it's a therapy dog in training, but even it's been used with a few students with some problematic behaviors that it's seen as a reward that if their behavior for a week, then they get like a 10 minute with the dog. And they said it's been amazing how the behaviors are no longer a concern because that is such a positive thing. Also for staff morale on PD days, <laughs> professional development days, um, the dogs go visit some campuses and I can't tell you how much that improves morale and how just even um, when the dogs here in admin, everybody is so excited and just wants um, to pet the dog. So I think that it is important too, thinking about our staff. Um, the last section, which is good because we only have 15 minutes. Um, if we'll go to the next slide is the student advocacy part and we can go one more. I hope you've seen throughout that we've talked about student advocacy throughout this presentation. Um, I always like to highlight this, and I know Chief has more to talk on this. Um, even some of the first slides I showed you of um, the complications of police in schools, we often hear that the discrepancy in discipline data in officers are saying because of um, police officers. Officers don't do discipline. Um, they should not be doing discipline. I'm not saying it doesn't have any elsewhere, but for our department, they are not part of that discipline. Process. That is not their lane. Their lane is law enforcement and criminal. Um, and those are different things. Now, are there times if something's criminal, there's also gonna be discipline action? Yes. But where we find the, the sweet spot of our student advocacy is where these two cross over. And it could it be criminal? Yes. Does it have to be? No. And so those are the aspects of where we all work together as a department, social workers, officers, um, as we talk with administration when something's occurred that we can advocate to this, the, the uh, administration and to the school that criminalizing a, a student's behavior isn't always in the best interest of the child. I would say majority of the time, it's not the best interest of the child. And are there other things we can do? Yeah, we, and we go through um, a very deliberate assessment on whether we should criminalize particular conduct. So just because conduct is criminal doesn't mean we need to criminalize the situation. And so we, because we are part of um, the student success team, are, are we lean more toward, is there a, a way to discipline for the conduct versus making it criminal? And the only time what we find that uh, we need to go pretty heavily on the criminal side is, I'll give you an example. So if there's um, vaping, vaping is a big problem across the country. 
most of the time, the majority of the time, we're trying to steer vaping toward discipline. We don't want to criminalize that activity because it's usually a phase that kids are going through and it shouldn't impact the rest of their lives by, by giving them a criminal record. However, if we find those situations where students are bringing large numbers of vaping pens onto campuses and distributing them, that's an entirely different situation. They are undermining the efforts of the school district to provide a safe and secure learning environment. And in those situations, we're going to come down relatively heavy on, on the criminal side of the situation. Well, I don't even... You know, and I think that's understanding what's going on underneath the surface for students that, you know, with vaping or any other kind of drug use, not distribution, mm -hmm. is there an underlying mental health condition that's never been um, identified and is currently not being treated? And so is that that's areas where our social workers can help. Um, what else is happening with the students? I will also say, too, and this is one area that, that we don't get to say is if there's been uh, an assault or something like that. That's the victim's choice that if they press charges or not. But how do we support the victim? But how do we also let them know all their different options in a way so that they feel fully educated on what path they want to take? Um, if, are there times where maybe administration wants a harsher punishment than what we advocate for? Yes, but as a department, our stance is very much of how do we help children and um, be realizing that if they're introduced into the criminal justice system, their life will forever be altered. And sometimes in ways that it can't ever come back from, which I think is always our, how do we help students um, learn um, and not be punished for juvenile behavior when their brains aren't fully even developed right now. Um, next slide. And this is the last content content. I wanna say this is something that um, within the Braille services we've adopted this last year. Um, when we do get called to a crisis situation, if we view it as crisis or not, what are ways we approach it to help students the most and, the, and families? And the first is pause. How do we pause? Um, sometimes in schools, we get so caught up in the ah, frantic that we have to pause and we can take a breath unless a student has a weapon or is currently being very physically aggressive, we have time to take a breath. We also need to be the calm. Um, we have to train in that way. Our officers are trained in that way. Um, we, we learn a lot from them. On how do we approach situations in a very calm manner? Because we know if we bring calm, we can help lower anxiety. We can help lower um, people with escalated thoughts and behaviors. But if we go up and try to meet where they are, it's only going to be disastrous. Also, empathy for all in any situation. Are we having empathy, of course, for the student, but for the families involved? You know, we've had some that families are struggling, that there has been a threat assessment done and a kid does have some very concerning behaviors. Then instead of just writing them off when the parents are saying, oh, it's no big deal, but realizing they might take some time to come to terms with what's happening with their child. And then that that is their child and that can be hard. And also for staff members, we're trained in these areas, our staff isn't, so how do we have empathy for them? And then always, how do we reduce trauma? I think that goes with not, arresting if we don't have to, because that's a tra traumatic experience. But even when a student is in suicide crisis, how do we not continue unknowingly increase trauma from how that happens? Um, you know, we take the students of a student suicidal and somebody and one of our counselors or social workers have done a screening on them. They don't need to keep, keep telling that story. Um, we can continue to move on and handle them in that way um, so that we, a traumatic situation is already happening. We don't need to increase what's going on there. Um, there was a question on whether ISD police department officers are going to detain youth on mental health warrants. I can just say across the board that one of the benefits for having a school place, a uh, school based police organization is that we can collaborate and partner with other agencies that may have interests and needs in terms of arresting students for activity that happens outside the school environment. And uh, in, my, in my history with school based policing, I found it very um, beneficial to work directly with those agencies so that the trauma for that event is minimized where we can schedule and coordinate an interaction with the, those other agencies with the student to make that transition to arrest that student less traumatic because it's not happening in front of their peers. It's not happening um, where it's going to spread throughout the, the campus community as a rumor. And so we try to minimize those, um, the, the highlight that we put on those um, necessary events. With regard to uh, mental health, uh, Lauren, specifically, do you have any thoughts on 
I don't see how we would be doing no, those. I, I'm not connecting. No, I, and I don't think we'd be interested in doing those. Um, we, if, if the students in crisis and requires immediate, um, uh, you know, commitment, and there's no other options, then, yeah. then we'll do it. But if there's other options, we're not, we're not going to uh, get involved in doing, doing it unnecessarily. Well, and what we say all the time in training is it is the absolute last resort. And even for an officer to do it or anybody, a social worker saying we need to do it, it has to go through um, us. Level five, levels of supervision. <laughs> supervision. Yeah. Chain of command. I'm very, <laughs> all the things I've learned is being in a police officer. Police department chain of command is really important, and that one it is. And it's not that we don't trust our people, but it's because we believe in so much it shouldn't be happening. That if it does happen, we want them to know they have our support and that we've signed off and we agree that that's the only um, contact. Um, somebody asked this question. I think it's a great within the crisis response of going back to the graph of um, suicide and different age groups and the reasoning for increase in suicide for the 10 to 12 year old age group. Let me just first say, I think we all are looking for the one reason suicide rates go up, um, what's happening, because we all want to help. Um, suicide is so highly complex, and so there's never one reason. Um, now, is there studies currently being conducted on the impact of mental, uh, on social media and um, suicide alley? Yes, there is. But we know that's not the complete picture because even before social media, we people died by suicide. And so um, if you're really interested in some of that research, if you go to AFSP.org, they're the largest private funder of research in this area. And they have some great research videos. Um, they're like two minutes long. So it's not like reading a very high, highly complex research article. So I encourage you to go there. They have topics on different areas. Um, about parents, teens, um, and they can be actually really educational so that I think they can be helpful with that. Um, somebody asked about therapy dogs and stuff with tier two. You know, we use those tiers just to sort of say where things are, but within our department, of course, you know, yes, our, it's not only tier three students who have been identified through an RTI process that um, receive services. We, we use that just because we know we have limited capacity. So we're we sort of say, if you've already tried other things and it haven't worked, then we will, um, that's when we step in. Um, but those aren't hard and fast. I do also, with that, want to say that um, I often get asked, do we serve um, students who are also receiving special education services? Absolutely. Um, we serve gen, gen ed students, and all students are gen ed students. And so we don't put any, especially with social work services, of where that. And as Chiefs mentioned, it's critical for our officers to also know a lot of our students who are part of special education, so we know how to be proactive and not reactive in that. We have to actually have an effort underway to get our officers more um, comfortable and knowledgeable about the special education populations in our campuses at the request of our family uh, parent advocacy group for, for that group. So we are very much engaged with trying to understand the particular needs of, of those students so that we can best serve them on the campus. And then the other thing I would um, just comment on this model and why it's so, uh, I think, helpful that uh, I am Amy's biggest advocate. And so we spend a lot of time talking about what she needs to be successful for her team. And uh, the fact that I answer directly to the superintendent, I think, allows for us to, to make a lot of progress mm -hmm. and to have the support of the entire organization. So I think that's where um, having that structure allows this model really to be optimized. When I, I'll say with that that um, our officers' biggest supporters are our social workers, and our social workers' biggest supporters are our officers, and their um, their desire to they're so protective. Like it, it, it's really if um, an officer somebody says something bad about an officer in general, the social workers like come up like I there was a situation even that I was like I feel like mama bear right now because they're going after because we we know them we know each other so well. And we are protective because we see what the other side does every day. And we appreciate it. I, I will say working within a police department, you realize what police do for us all the time. But then when I look at our officers and I have a nine-year-old who's also in our school district and I look at the faces of all our officers and if something happened, I know without a doubt they would put their life on the line for me or my child. Um, it's completely humbling working in the department and getting to serve alongside them when my job doesn't require the same. And so I think that mutual respect um, only happens because we're in the same department. We also often get asked, well, even if you're outside of the department, couldn't this 
um, work in the same way. And no, it, it couldn't. Um, it, it doesn't because we see other districts where it's outside and it, it's a totally different setup. And it comes down to the trust. The, the, our two professions rely a lot on trust to work together effectively and efficiently. And I think what we've, we've developed here um, validates that. Mm -hmm. And it has to start at the top down, right? We can't expect officers and social workers to do it if they don't see the mutual respect and trust from us and in all areas. And so I think that's um, where it starts and it can only happen with a chief of police who fully buys into it. And that's why when we were hiring a new chief of police, I'm like, I gotta be on the interview committee <laughs> because I have such a, I have an invested interest of the way we do things. Somebody did ask, because we have two minutes, um, talked about is when we call um, the local mental health authority, there are times we do, there are also times because of our social workers, we can automatically um, send a student um, to a hospital. And even if that's through an emergency detention order, which like I said, we've done with one. Um, we do have a great relationship with our local mental health authority. Um, I meet with them monthly because we have some contracts with them for um, mental health counseling on campuses. And that's a critical relationship too, especially for our students who don't have insurance or funds. Um, that we, we do contact them. Doesn't mean they have to come out at those times because we do the same screening they would do, but we are able to talk and communicate and have that um, information flow. Uh, uh, on the therapy dogs, if anybody's interested in more information, uh, contact either Amy or I. We both have resources that we can provide in terms of uh, how, to, how to set up a therapy dog program. It's not as easy as you think. Um, and there's a lot you have to think through, but we can help uh, and, and coach any uh, district that would like to get one started. And then there's a question about, is there a larger pres presence of officers in our high schools? So we have, um, we have five traditional high schools. And on those campuses, because of the population size, we typically have two officers on those campuses. And they're usually between 35 and 3,700 students per campus. And some of our campuses are laid out like college campuses, so they're fairly broad. So uh, two is probably not even sufficient on our bigger campuses uh, because, it, because of the response times to get across campus. But having said that, we have uh, really robust coverage in our middle and high schools on campus and our elementary schools currently are patrolled. Um, so we are trying to get um, a little bit more capacity in that, in that regard. We may be modifying our patrol model after the new year. Yeah, and I will say it, it's wonderful when the officers do get to go do visit, visits on elementary campuses. And this is where we've had to educate some of our, you know, even administration meeting the best, but wanting an officer to come and, you know, the student's behavior and like, can you scare them? And no, the officer's job is not to scare students. They, they need to be seen as the person who helps our students. And so those are a lot of the education we can do, you know, not just for while in school, but in the community, we want them to know that if they're in trouble, they go to an officer. Um, and so, you know, it's growth for all of us every day. I think we find ways to refine and redo what we're doing and make it better that we've only, you know, we're in our third year as a police department. So we're very, very young. And while we've done a lot, there is so much more we want to do and we can do. And I think in, with regard to the balance between administration and the police department, we're rolling out a, um, an expectations contract with uh, the campuses in the next, uh, probably in January. And what that is, it articulates what expectations there are from the, uh, from the campus with regard to the school SRO supporting them, our office on campus. But then at the same time, what the police department expects from the, the campus administration in support of police efforts. So it's, it's a mutual contract. And, and this way, uh, it, it provides an opportunity for communication between the principal and the chain of command with the police department. And it also then um, makes it clear in terms of expectations what each will be expected to do. Absolutely. Um, we are to our mark at 1015. Clearly, <laughs> Steve Weiner and I can talk about this all day. Um, it's really, yeah, we, we were going to get some scenarios, but I think we did some of those already. Thank you. Like we said, if you have any questions about any of this, please reach out. We love to talk and share and learn about what you're doing.